Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it. With the new Galaxy S24 Ultra and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. I'm Todd Jones, recovering from 30 years as a sports writer. Thanks for joining me as I sit down with some of the best sports writers of our time who knew the greatest athletes and coaches and experienced firsthand some of the biggest sports moments of the past half century. We'll share stories behind the stories, some we've only told each other. Pull up a seat on Press Box Access. While growing up on Long Island, an ink-stained child made a bold prediction. I'm going to be sports columnist for the New York Post, he told his parents. Mike Vaccaro was seven years old, and he was right. Vaccaro has held that high-profile, high-intensity job in the Big Apple since 2002. The work is deep in his soul. Vac, as everyone knows him, is one of those sports writers who can throw all the pitches. Curveball, changeup, heater. Oh yeah, Vac can bring it tabloid style, even though he's one of the nicest guys in sports media. And he's kept his childhood love for the crazy job, despite some serious health challenges. Let's head to New York and places beyond. Mike, welcome to Press Box Access. It's great to have you join us. Great to be here, Todd. Good to see you again. It's so great to see you again. I know it's uh, it's great news for this show because as the uh, columnist at the New York Post, you're a four-time sports writer of the year in New York. Not only that, you're also one of my favorite people in the business, so I'm just... Just happy to to have you join us there. Hey, VAC is back. VAC hey. is back. That's one of my favorite headlines from uh, 2023. I was thrilled by your return, not only to the keyboard, but to the golf course, even though I know how you golf. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful to read your column in June 2023 about once again playing the game you love after various health conditions which caused the need to have your left leg amputated below the knee a year earlier. Uh, so we'll just start with that. How are you doing, Vac? Yeah, Todd, I'm doing really well. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, a little dicey there. I mean, obviously, nobody wants to uh, go through that. Uh, don't know wants to spend that much time in hospitals and rehab centers the way I did that through much of 2022. Um, but you know what? I'm on the other side of it, and life is, 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 is unbelievable right now. Uh, you know, able to walk. Uh, you know, sometimes with the aid of a cane, sometimes not, but just uh, be able to get around wherever I need to go, I can get to professionally and personally. And as you referenced, uh, play, play some golf. And as you also know very well, uh, I, I was a lot good on the golf course beforehand. So my expectations were low and I was able to, uh, to exceed uh, that lack of expectation. Now, it's, it's, it's great. You know, I'm able, to, I'm able to have my life back again. You know, unfortunately, I had some leg issues that, 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 that haunted me for years. And they got worse and worse. And it really just, you know, it, it wouldn't allow me to do the things that I want to do, which is, you know, play golf, do my job the way it's supposed to be done. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, when we talk about uh, being good reporters, you talk about shoe leather, right? Because you just, you know, you're not necessarily always walking to the places you got to go to or running after people. But, you know, a lot of that involves that. And I just wasn't able to do that nearly as well as I'd been. And, and uh, ultimately reached a, you know, kind of a do or die point with uh, what we wanted to do about the leg. And uh, was really encouraged by, by by a great team of doctors that uh, that my life would, would would my quality of life would be better after I had the procedure, which they've been proven to be 100 percent accurate. <clears throat> and I was lucky because the you know after the uh, after the amputation, I was you know cared for by this is a remarkable team of of doctors, the therapists, uh, you know, getting friends and family, but just the the therapists and the doctors. Uh, I, I remain blown away by the uh, by the care and the attention to detail they took to, you know, in, in, in terms of reclaiming me being able to do the things I want to do with my life. And, you know, I sit here with you today, you know, a couple of weeks before the new year, and I do really do feel like I've got a new life. And it's, uh, it's really kind of amazing. You know, uh, look, I mean, there are, you know, everybody has their, 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 their moments and their days after you go through something like this, where you're like, you know, I really wish this wasn't this way. But in the overall, um, you know, I embraced it early, which probably helped my recovery and my, you know, adaptability 
Um, you know, look, I mean, nothing, you know, I, I spent a long piece of time where I wasn't just, I just physically wasn't able to go into press boxes. And now I can do that again. And it's, uh, you know, it really is kind of a, kind of an amazing thing. Well, it's wonderful to have Vac back because I know, uh, back, I know you've met so many different journalists and, and writers and broadcasters over 30 plus years in the business. And I know that you received a lot of love and support from your peers because of how well liked and respected you are. I'm kind of curious, you know, all those years of writing about athletes, coaches, and administrators, did, did any of those folks reach out to you? What kind of feedback did you get from uh, people you actually write about and sometimes write about in ways that they don't like? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Literally within a 24-hour space. So I had the procedure done in August of 2022. And literally within a 24-hour space, I heard from the general manager, manager of the Mets, and the general manager, manager of the Yankees. And, you know, when you consider the time of the calendar, August is a pretty busy time for all those folks. And yet they managed to find the time to look out, to, to reach out, and, and offer me well. And like, like you said, I haven't always written kindly about any of them, uh, but I think they're all, you know, professional enough to know that that's just part of the job, and that's, you know, part of what... Uh, what it, what it is when you when you participate in pro sports and when you cover them, um, you know. And as 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 I've, as I've reintegrated back into my job, uh, you know, a lot of the other folks have taken a gun out of their way to come over and shake hands and ask how I'm doing and stuff. Uh, you know, I, I I always thought that uh, I might have stood out in the crowd a little bit just because I was a little bigger than the average guy in terms of <laughs> or taking a little bit too much over the top in life. And now it's funny. I think I probably feel like you know, I pile up the weight because I usually show up with a pair of, with a pair of canes in my hand. So <laughs> if you had any question which one was the guy with the with the peg leg, now they know it's me. Um, but it's oh so, <laughs> but it's but, but but also, I mean, you know, one thing I've learned overwhelmingly, Todd, is that ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people are, are generally nice uh, as their default position. Whether it means you know I go into a store and people you know run out of their chairs to open the door. You know, uh, I've, yeah, and, uh, it, it's, it's, it's been, there have been a lot of examples of people whose, you know, default position is compassion, even strangers. That's and, great to hear. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean that, really that's is. fabulous. I, mean, yeah. I had the one person, I had the one lady in the gym who said, maybe I should wear sweatpants instead of shorts. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and even with that, that moment, because I was frightening her daughter. Oh. And even that moment was Trump because the manager of the gym said, maybe you should find another place to work out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, well, good. The end, at the end of the day, I guess compassion and empathy were now. That's great to hear. Vac, I, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you're, you're writing again, the New York Post, 21 years as the uh, sports columnist there. And, you know, we talked about these health issues. I mean, you've been through it. I mean, you had a heart attack in 2006 yeah. and, you know, it's not like sports writers are working in the salt mines, but when you look back on 30 plus years, it is kind of a crazy lifestyle, right, Mike? Crazy and fun. Look, I mean, Todd, the reason why you and I became friends, look, you, know, you were based in Ohio, I was based in New York. I mean, generally speaking, people, you know, who, who do that, you do the same line of work, don't necessarily spend a lot of time together. And yet, you know, because of the, the demands of the profession, are you wind up, you know, on the road a lot. And look, I mean, no doubt at the beginning of my career, that was absolutely what I loved most about it, was getting out of plane. And, you know, one of the, you know, one of the blessings is, you know, I've worked, you know, Three places in my, you know, in my in past the age of thirty at the Kansas City Star, Newark Star Ledger, and New York Post, where they, you know, their mission was get on a plane and get there, you know, and that, that, that that's what we that's what that's what I did, that's what you did, that's what we all did, and so you know, yes, I mean, it, it, it leads to a little bit of a, a hectic life, sometimes it leads to a fairly unhealthy life, frankly, because you're always you're relying on room service at eleven thirty at night, which isn't probably the best plan of action, right? Um, you know, and until you realize that you have to kind of figure out how to sneak in time at the gym every day, how you have to figure out you know, how to have at least an occasional salad once in a while, all that kind of stuff. But all that stuff, but, but, but that, that's not a complaint. That's just, you know, as you talked about, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, the, it's the crazy nature of the job. And the fact is that, uh, you know, if you and I saw each other five times a year, they were usually, uh, you know, say, at, you know, at the final four, the shoot ball, Augusta National, if you ask people that stuff, <laughs> They're like, well, where do I sign up? And they're right, right? right? Because it's right. a lot of fun. Yeah, no complaining. Look, there's no complaining. They're very social job. You know, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of the best columns you write, I think you would discover, you, you would agree a lot of the best stuff you write comes from being around, you know, an Applebee's at 1.30 in the morning as they're, as they're <laughs> trying to clean the room up because, 
because you're just you're shooting all kinds of stories and doing all kinds of story ideas. And I'll tell you what, one of the you know one of the great uh, lines I ever received is a guy that I know that you know well, Gary Shelton. Mm-hmm. You know, we were talking about something one day, and next thing I know, uh, the idea we talked about at ten thirty at night appeared in this column, and I said, "What you know?" He said, "What's up with that?" He said. You wear it, you share it, pal. <laughs> and that's <laughs> that's the best part, right? I mean, you, you, you know, you, you learn you learn the lessons of on the record and off the record. If you're going to steal, you got to have your best lines stolen by your friends. That's right. All's <laughs> fair in sports writing. Absolutely, hundred percent. Well, Mike, you've been doing what you wanted to do as a child, uh, and your love for it has never wavered. Um, take us back to your childhood. You grew up in New York, West Hempstead, I believe. That's right. One and your dad, your dad, like used to bring home the New York Post, which you are now the voice of for 21 yeah. years. What was it like as a kid? Why did you get into sports writing? Well, you know, it, 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 it really is a crazy story. And I, um, and I grew up in a, you know, in a sports-loving family. My father was, was a huge sports fan uh, and, and also a family that encouraged, you know, dreams. You know, my father, early on, I can remember being 12, 13 years old saying, like, don't, don't be me. You know, this guy who ran the who drove, who rode the Long Island Railroad 30 years and hated every minute of it. You know, he was, he had a lot of other things he would have preferred to do. And he did this because he had to, you know, he had to feed his family. And I always, of course, loved and respected that. But I loved and respected the fact that he said, don't do this. If you can avoid doing this, do, what, do whatever, whatever it is you like, do what you like. So the story kind of goes back to old timers day at Shea, 1974. I'm seven years old. And of course, wide eyes is my first baseball game. And I just, you know, it's, it's like the greatest day of my life. We get to we get to Chase Stadium. My father's pointing, pointing at all the you know the, the things that I should know about. There's Joe DiMaggio. There's Willie Mays. I have a Kanish. It's delicious. Um, and then he points to the uh, to the press box. He says that you know, that that's, that's where the sports writers do their work. And I said I was puzzled. And I said, "You mean you can actually make a living doing this?" And he's like, "No, oh, some people do." And you know, he 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 worked in the city. So he would, what he would do is he would buy the Daily News going into New York, and the New York Post, which is an afternoon paper, then on his way home. And so that's what he would you know, hand me when he got home every day and I would absorb the paper as we're preparing dinner. And I announced when I was seven, eight years old, I said, I want to be a sports columnist at the New York Post. I literally said that to my father. And, you know, in 19, uh, in, in uh, 2002, that dream came true. I mean, you know, I, 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 would, I tell that story a lot because I think it's a great story. And also, you know, how many people can you talk to who said they actually, you know, the thing they want to do when they were seven years old is what they wound up doing when they grew up. I mean, maybe I should have had higher ambitions. Maybe I should have been a, you know, wanted to be a senator or something, but. You know, I was uh, I was a sports writer in training from the time I was seven, and so that makes uh, the fact that I'm able to do this uh, that much more remarkable, I think. All right, you mentioned a tabloid. The New York Post is famous as a tabloid. It's a different style of sports writing. By the way, do you have a favorite New York Post headline on one of your columns? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's kind of a funny show. You know, one of the things you learn about the Post is that sometimes you'll laugh, and sometimes a laugh is at your expense. And when Isaiah Thomas was uh, was managing or mismanaging the Knicks, <clears throat> one, so one Sunday morning, one Saturday night, I, I you know I just yeah I, I had eviscerated him in a column, and I realized that that I was going to have to answer to that anyway. But then I woke up on Sunday morning, and there was Isaiah on the back page of the paper in a full clown suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think the you know, <laughs> clown show or something like that. And so it's funny. I was supposed to actually start vacation uh, Monday. And I, read, I told my wife, I said, we're going to have to put off our vacation a couple hours. I got to go to the fixed facility for practice on Monday. You know, <laughs> as, as, I'm sure, as I'm sure you were taught by your mentors and I was taught by mine, the one rule that, that, that holds fast and true is if you rip somebody, you better, you better make yourself accessible. Then. Not because you're looking to get into it and want to get into a fight or anything, but you want to give them the opportunity to have equal time. And so, so Monday was spent at the uh, Knicks practice facility with Isaiah staring bullets at me and he never actually referenced it because I think he figured if we didn't talk about it, it would go away. So Isaiah was in a clown suit. Yes, sir. Well, on the back cover of the New York back, Post. Yes, on the back. You show up at practice and he doesn't confront you? No, I mean, I, to, to, to Isaiah's credit, to a lot of the guys who I covered in New York, um, I, I think they just realized that whether they like it or not, that's part of the game. I mean, I'm not going to say that he was going to, you know, it's funny, his first couple of years in town, he, he owned a popcorn company. And so every, every Christmas, we would get this huge tub of popcorn. And it was Good popcorn. It was really good popcorn. And I, I don't think I got those popcorn canisters any longer after he was you know, under my bio in a cloud suit. But uh, yeah, he, 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 he but, but you know, to their credit, look, it's a, it's, it, 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 you know, my job is, is, is to criticize, also to praise. And I, and, 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 you know, 
we can get to this later, but you know, I far prefer to praise than to criticize because I think I personally think that sells more newspapers and gets more clicks. The good stuff gets more stuff. It's, you know, it's better for business than the bad stuff, but you know, sometimes the bad stuff happens. So you got to get into it. And of course, as you know, you, you know, we're talking about tabloids at large, you know, it's, 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 it, it is a different prism through which you look at the world and certainly a different prism through which you view the sports world. And I learned that lesson pretty quickly. Did you get some advice early on when you became the columnist there? Because like, like you mentioned, you worked in Kansas City at the Star. You worked in Newark. And now you're at the tabloid New York Post. What kind of advice did you get, if any, about how you should write well, a column for the Post? The, uh, the, the, the two best pieces of advice were very disparate. They both came from people who were already at the Post. One was uh, the late Jay Greenberg, a wonderful man who was, a, was my colleague there for many years. And uh, he congratulated me when I got the job. And he said, here's the deal. He said, there's going to be 360 days every year when he's going to wake up in the morning. And he'd be like, yeah, I work at the Post, man. Let's go get him. And then there's going to be five days every in the, in the course of those years. And he probably didn't realize at the time, but like, you know, days when you wake up and there's a clown on the back page in the tail of the news because of something on, on the back page of the Post because of something you wrote. And you're like, oh, man, I work at the Post. <laughs> <laughs> but the good days outweigh the bad. And of course, the, the probably the, the uh, the, the best piece of advice I got was from the guy who hired me, a guy by the name of Greg Gallo. Uh, his father, Bill, was a longtime cartoonist and boxing writer for the Daily News. Uh, so that, that's a guy who literally was born into the business. Um, I, 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 and there are legendary stories in New York about when he first took over at the Post and what a tyrant he was. By the time I got to see him, he was one of the great gentlemen I've ever met in my life. Uh, and had mellowed, but still, but still had to, had, still, you know, he lived to beat the Daily News every day. And it's hilarious because, of course, his father still worked at the Daily News. So that was a lot of fun to observe. But, uh, you know, he, 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 was, he was something of a, of a jump for him to, to hire me. I mean, as you mentioned, I mean, you know, my, I cut my teeth at the, the Kansas City Star and then at the Newark Star-Ledger, both of whom had very similar uh, outlook to how you cover sports. Um, and, and, and they allowed their columnists, and, you know, I look back now and I say, I really can't believe it. They, they almost encouraged us to write long, to write 1,200, 1,300 words. That's too long for a column, in my opinion, except you have if you're going to write about your amputated leg, you can go a little bit long. <laughs> yeah, but, I think so. Yeah. But, you know, that, that's kind of, you know, but that's what, that, that, that's what we did. And, you know, I, I, you know, I've been lucky. I've never had a problem going long when asked to go long. So what did Gallo tell you? He said, look, he said, you got to get in and out. you got to get in and out of the time it takes. Some guy to get on the subway and get off the subway. And I want you to grab him by the lapels and say, here's what I think. He's like, I, li he's like, I like your college. Too many of these things. I gotta, I'm looking at my watch saying, when is it going to get to the goddamn point? And he said to me, I, I, those words stayed, you know, stayed in my mind forever. And he was right. You know, they, 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 and you're, you're, you're wasting people's time if, you, if you're worried about your fancy writing. That's, uh, that was lesson one that I learned at the, at the Post. It's, it's, it's a very unique way to approach things, and I get it. And I'm glad that I've, that I've been able to, to do that because I think I've become a better writer. All right, you mentioned Gallo, and I want to take you back to 2003. <laughs> there was a column you wrote. St. John's <laughs> wanted to hire John Calipari. And um, he was at Memphis at the time. And you're the new fire breather at the New York Post. And you had had some history with Cal. I think you knew him back at when you were, he was at UMass. And, and he was with the Nets when you were in Newark. Yep. So you write a column about whether or not St. John said hire John Calipari. What happened? Well, I should probably preface this by saying that uh, in, in, in my salad days, I was a lot more, uh, um, I was a lot angrier, I guess, but I also was, was, was I mean, I, I wanted to, I wanted to prove what a tough guy I was. Like, why I, I had no problem throwing out cheap shots. And that's just by way of explanation. The column I wrote about Cal Perry is probably one of the great eviscerations of my career. And part of it was Wait, personal. His, his head is above your mantle. Is that really? That I mean, and it's, and it's interesting because, because uh, uh, I actually had a, he was actually quite good to me when I was, uh, when I was a student at St. Bonaventure. He gave me like 25 minutes after a UMass sheet around one time. I just, just, just very, it was it had been very nice to me. Um, I, I covered him with the nets. I'd seen a little bit of his act up close. Didn't much care for it. Um, uh, had a little sanctimony in me, I'll, I'll admit. Um, and I just did, I, I, I St. John's is actually one of these sacrosanct things, at least back then it was. And I still admire St. John's because I grew up, if I grew up anything as a kid, I was a St. John's fan. I was a Chris Mullen fan. I was, 
It was a Louis Carter second guy. St. John's matters to me. So you had a vested interest in whether or not that school should hire John. And probably more than they should have. And of course, for the, the fact is that they would have hired him, you know, they, they probably would have been a lot more successful than they've been the last 20 years. But they didn't. Uh, and they didn't primarily, I was told, because of after I wrote what I wrote, there's no way the president could hire him. Because I went into a lot of, I went into a lot of the nitty gritty. I mean, you know, then look, I mean, what, what, what I read, what a column is supposed to do. I, I don't apologize for it. I can understand why he was upset. And so the best part of the story is that, uh, so the next day, the phone, the, the, the Gallo shows up for, for work, 8, 8 o'clock, 8.15 in the morning. And there's this like four minute voicemail waiting for him from a very angry John Calipari. And, you know, he just, he, he's, he can tell he's just kind of venting, but he's like, you know, I know how you people are. You're not, you're not going to have, 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 the, have the guts to call me. But if you do, here's my number. Boom, boom, boom. For four so minutes? Gallo, four yeah, minutes of ranting. Well, four minutes of just every... And it was, it was it was great. I mean, he played it for me one time. It was it was he was every one of the seven words you can't say on TV and about twenty five more. <laughs> and, and, and and so and, and so uh, you know, Gallo doesn't care. Gallo is Gallo about two two years away from retirement at that point. He's not going to let John Calipari ruin his day. So he, so so he, so he calls him back, and so basically basically Cal starts in with the exact same rant that he left on the on the on the, on the, on the machine. And, and I should say here. I don't blame him. I mean, if I had read that about myself, I'd have been angry too. I mean, you know, absolutely. <laughs> and so, so Gallo lets me have a steady. At the end, he says, I don't know what to tell you, John. And, and you didn't. So, 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 so Cal asks, of course, says, you mean to tell me it's okay with you if Mike Ficarra wakes up one day and says, you know what? I'm just going to hammer Cal today. That's okay with you? And Cal had told him, that's why I pay him. <laughs> and to Cal's credit, he laughed. And he said, well, we <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Thanks. And that was that. So, <laughs> um, and of course, yeah, I, I, like, I, mean, I guess because you've been about everything through the years. I mean, you know, I, I don't think that uh, I've ever, you know, I don't think I've ever had any kind of reconciliations. I certainly don't think that he's needed one. <laughs> he's, he's got on, as you might have heard, he's, he's got on the bigger and better things. And, you know, and, and, you know, and I'm kind of comfortable where I am. But yeah, it, 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 I don't know that I, would, that I would write the column with quite that intensity in 2023 as I did in 2003. I'll say that. Did Cal ever say anything to you about that one particular column? Uh, to me personally, uh, no. I, I have I have been around him at other NCAA tournaments and stuff, and he's always answered my questions. And I mean, he, he obviously knows who I am because he and I had a relationship when he covered the Nets. Um, but uh, um, so, but but that, that's that, that's fine. Well, you changed college basketball history. St. John's could have had John Calipari. Now that's they've good. got the other guy, Rick Pitino. Imagine that. <laughs> And, and, and that, that, that's the hilarious part because really you can say that's, you know, that they're, they're bookends on the same shelf in a lot of ways, right? And of course, when St. John's hired you know, Patino, I wrote like it was, it was if they hired, you know, Pope Francis. So <laughs> <laughs> such is the way of life, I guess. Everything, and, goes, uh, to, everything goes to 11 at the Post. Exactly. And, 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 and by the way, there are more than enough people with long enough memories in New York that they were very happy to point out the fact that uh, they, 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 they weren't quite sure how they have a value system where John Calipari was the devil, and uh, Rick Pitino was St. Peter. But uh, so it goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cal would have been happy about 10 years prior to that, because as you mentioned, you once got fired. You were the sports editor at the Northwest Arkansas Times yeah. in 1993. You're like 25 years old, and you got fired. What the hell happened? I, was, I mean, the best way to describe it is I was 25. I was young. I was dumb. I thought I knew. I thought I knew a lot more than I did about the world. Um, I thought I was smarter than those people down there, of course, because you know what? Uh, what uh, some would New, what New Yorker uh, you know plopped out in, in in Northwest Arkansas probably wouldn't feel that way. I mean, it's just when we do twenty five, you know, I realized you know looking back just how how horribly arrogant I must have been. Um, and all that said, look, I mean, I was I, I basically was hired. I basically was hired there. Because I was, I was, I worked at a paper in a similar chain in Olean. I was recruited there to work because they, they wanted me to be able to write there, and that's what I did. I was now I was a terrible sports editor. I mean, I was I didn't I didn't have, I was not good with details. I hated reading other people's copy. I mean, it was that was the probably the wrong job for me to have. But I wanted to 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 to, to see the world a little bit and experience covering the SEC. And I thought it was a good idea. And it was. I mean, my overwhelming amount of memories there are positive memories. One thing I met my wife there, so it's hey, it's, hard feel, it's hard not to feel warm about Arkansas. I love my colleagues. It just so happened that after a series of bosses, I got two that that, that just didn't click with me, 
and we didn't, didn't want to put up with my stuff. I mean, it was, I was a lot. I had opinions about the way things should be, should be done. I mean, you wanted to put ads on the sports front page and I acted like it was the, it was the greatest crime ever committed in journalism. I mean, I, I was, I, I was a lot. And so much to the point where, I mean, I, I, it's not worth the details going into, but just suffice to say that a little bit of code, I took a shot at my publisher in a column I wrote where, oh. I, killed, where I killed Frank Broyles. And uh, that plus the fact that the publisher wanted to go play Augusta National as Frank's guest, I had to be Hester Frank Broyles, who had had enough of me. He had quite enough of me after about two weeks, let alone two years. Um, I, I want to be like, oh, but you know, in the moment I was filled with righteous indignation because how could you fire me over this? It's freedom of the press and blah, blah, blah. And of course, 30 years later, I'm like, I can't believe that they put up with me as long as they did because I just was, and look, it was, it was in many ways a defining moment of my life, Todd. It really was my life, not just my career. Because I realized, hey, I had to grow up right away. I had to, I had to, I had to identify, this was my fault. It wasn't somebody else's fault. It was my fault. I also had to, I, I also recognized in that moment just how precious an opportunity I'd been given to work in a field I really wanted to. Now, at the time, there was no guarantee that I wasn't just going to spend my life, you know, working in Fayetteville, Arkansas, or places like that. And that mm-hmm. would have been fine with me. That's how much I loved the job. But then it was taken away from me because, you know, I was an impetuous, immature jerk. And, you know, it, 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 it informed every move I've ever made since. Everything I want to say in a column, everything I want to say to a boss, um, every dealing I had with an editor, um, and, you know, I'm grateful for it. I mean, I can say, I can say it now. It's easy to say now. It wasn't very hard. It wasn't very easy to say in 1993 when I'm driving around the South uh, you know, in a beat-up car trying to find another job. <clears throat> but it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. You know, one thing that's interesting about Arkansas, a beat like that, is, you know, we think of newspaper wars in New York, right, in big cities. But I know from having gone to school with, the University of Kentucky and and knowing the SEC, even back in the Stone Age of the 1980s, and it's only gotten crazier now, but the type of journalism wars that go on on a beat like, say, Arkansas basketball, what did that, what was that like for you as a young reporter that maybe helped you later on? Oh, it was the greatest, it was, it was, it was by far, and by, I mean by far, the greatest and, and angriest newspaper war I've ever been involved in. And you're right, nobody knows about it because it's so just so with Arkansas. But covering Arkansas and those that, when I arrived in July of 1991, on the beat, I arrived in July of 1991, on the beat, whereas the Northwest Arkansas Times, that's Faithful, that's me, that's, that's, that's where the university is located. Springdale, which is next out over, they covered it, home on the road, every other day. There was Rogers, there was Bentonville. And then there were two Little Rock papers in their own ridiculous newspaper war, but both of them, had three people each in the Fable Bureau. Sure. And so that's what, I mean, to, 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 so that's, that, that's where, I mean, you, you walk into that and it's the most remarkable learning ground there is. And you had to write something, I mean, you had to write something good every day because if you didn't, they had people, they had five other things to compare it to. And people took up multiple papers then too. And it was, it, it was the greatest learning experience of my life. Look, you know, I, I spent 21 years in New York Post. Sadly, the last few of them, there's really not going to a war at all because the daily news is diminished. The Times doesn't exist in sports anymore. You know, there's Newsday and there's us. There's a little bit of Bergen Record. But, you know, you, just, just the, when you think about a quintessential New York newspaper where you think about the Post and the Daily News, and, you know, that, that, that extends, that, that exists to a degree now, but it's not nearly what it was when I was hired. And, you know, I had my own little newspapers awards back in the day because my, you know, one of my best friends, you know, Adrian Wojnarowski was the Bergen Record. And that was the Newark Star Ledger. So that, you know, those are three fun years where we tried to outdo each other every day. But even that, I mean, nothing compares to the war that I was at, you know, that, that I was involved in, uh, in, in Facebook. It was, it was the greatest training ground ever. And sadly, that's never going to exist because most of those papers are all owned by the same people now. And it's not even there. It's not the same. It's just, you know, the business as, as, a, as a whole is, is, is different. But uh, that, was, that was just spectacular. It's uh, an unparalleled learning experience. So that newspaper war in Arkansas taught you a lot about staying on your toes. Did it also teach you about writing fast? Because, Vac, you're known as one of the <laughs> fastest writers on Deadline, which is kind of like a fast gun in the Wild West. I mean, you just have that reputation. Which I mean, which, 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 which I, uh, I appreciate. I appreciate you saying it. Um, I appreciate having that reputation, and I do, do know that. Um, to, when, when, when I first uh, arrived in, uh, in this area 25 years ago, uh, uh, for, for some reason, whatever reason, 
uh, Dave Anderson, the great columnist for the New York Times, took a liking to me. He took the papers, that was stuff, so he read me every day, so that helped. But uh, he took a real liking to me, became a genuine mentor. Him and Jerry Eisenberg uh, were just incredibly uh, generous with their advice. But Dave told me one thing uh, early on that, I, that, that, that that's held fast with me. He said, you got to be better than anybody who's faster than you and faster than anybody that's better than you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. you, now, look, I mean, I, I attribute the, the skill, whatever you want to call it, the craft of being able to write fast uh, to my first newspaper jobs at Olean in Fayetteville and even Middletown, New York, where, you know, and you know what this is like when you work the high school desk. I mean, you're getting 35 calls a night. Uh, at small papers where I was at, sometimes I was the only person in the office, so I had to handle. It was it was it was it was completely insane. You know, we had to had to get the you know ten volleyball scores and the ten soccer scores and the you know the football scores right. I uh, had to get the names right. You weren't necessarily as familiar with those names as you were with say you know Nolan Richardson. Um, you had to get the stats right. You had to keep your own stats. You had to keep index cards to keep all the stuff right. The only way you're going to do that is to be able to get to get proficient. You had to get and to write quickly. And that's how I became fast. Um, no doubt. Um, I hate every minute of it. I hate every minute of taking high school sports. I didn't mind and never did mind covering high school football games, covering high. It wasn't that I thought I was, that, that, that I was above high school sports, but the, uh, the labor of making sure that you do high school sports as a clerk, basically, and get everything right. I told you I was a lousy sports editor. I was probably a lousy clerk too, for the same reason, because my natural affinity is to think about how can I make this sound good and not, did I get the score right? Did I get the guy's name right? I'll tell you what, you know, my first boss told me that, 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 that you're more, there's more, there's more, there's more minefields and smaller paper because, you know what, if you score, if you, you think you're right about the local high school quarterback, you know, 25 papers are going to get sold. And if they do and, you, and the name is wrong, you're going to hear about it and you're probably going to get in trouble for it. And so it's a great, that, that's also a great lesson to, uh, to, to, to have learned what I learned it. Okay, years later, when you're covering big events and much bigger markets, what is the worst deadline you ever faced? Well, the most interesting one was in China when they uh, made a point of, if you recall, make a, made, made a point of having Michael Phelps' races early in the morning so it would coincide with you know, prime time back home. And so that meant a crazy thing where you, were, you, you had to wake up you know, five in the morning and you woke up on deadline. Waking up on deadline is rough. I mean, to me, there's no harder deadline. There's, there's really not a hard deadline when you know what it is, which is usually at 7 o'clock. And that's what, you know, we have the post, we have our three deadlines. We have, you know, we, we have 7.30, we have you know, 11.15, we have 1 o'clock. And then we have, you know, whatever, whatever you can else after the internet. Um, <clears throat> you know, in, in, in China, you woke up on deadline and it was, it was, it was stressful. It was, I saw, I saw a confrontation between two people there, both of whom are incredibly nice people. And I thought in the moment they were going to kill each other because they were on deadline. They were stressed out after, you know, and, and one of them was working for Baltimore, so they had extra stress of having to write about the hometown boy. And it was the most remarkable, you know, adrenaline rush every day because, you know, you're getting off deadline and you just have to find some place to eat, maybe have a beer. You know, this is, of course, at you know, 11 o'clock in, in the morning because you just sit in the because so, so so those deadlines were crazy. Um, you know, I, the, 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 the only time I ever missed deadline was in 2001 uh, when the Yankees and the Diamondbacks played that World Series. And in game four, uh, I think it was uh, Scott, uh, uh, Tino Martinez hit a home run with two outs in the ninth to tie the game. Next day, same situation, Yankees are down two. So I decided to go down in the old Yankee Stadium. You, know, you left your computer upstairs, you went down the stairs to the clubhouse. I went again to the clubhouse. I already filed my, my, uh, my running column. And of course, as I'm approaching the locker room, the, the place blows up basically with, with noise. And Scott Perugia has done the same thing. And so I had to call the office and, you know, and, and just basically say that, you, that you, you couldn't run the call. No, it was no longer relevant. And so uh, they, you know, they, 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 they did. I'm not sure what they did, but, uh, but so no column ran that day. We're not being for that edition anyway. Um, but that's the only one that I can remember. So that was one time when, that, that was one time when, you look back and it causes you some angst all these years later, I'm sure. Well, sure, because, because now, Michael, I've, 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 I've already you know, sort of th th thrown a blank for one of the editions. One of, this, 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 you know, this next one better be good. And, you know, the funny, the funny thing is, I'm sure, I'm sure someplace in the Essex County Library is an edition of the Star Ledger where there's no Mike McCarrick column of Game 5 of the World Series. Oops. So, uh, so that gives me angst all these years later. But um, you know what? I actually, I mean, I, I, I think I'm probably one of the rare people that, 
And I, I, I attribute this partly to what you, we talked about be, just, just before about, you know, being a little proficient writing on deadline. But also, you know, I'm lucky enough to write a job that I love. I, I, I haven't, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't uh, done a cover letter in like 22 years. You know, I haven't put together a resume because I've had a job that I really have no desire to ever leave. So I think one of the things, you know, one of the things that that allows you to do is, I think, you know, you probably had interest to tell you this, and I know I did. You know, don't write for, don't write for, the, for, for, for your colleagues. Don't write for your friends. Don't write for the judges at the contest you submit to. Write for your readers. And it's easier said than done, but after a while, you realize, okay, I'm here. I'm not, I'm not, trying, to, I'm not trying to impress everybody with every syllable and every clever turn of phrase. Also, I realize that if I don't write a great column today, I'm going to have another chance to do it tomorrow. And tomorrow will be better. And so I, I just don't allow that. I, I don't allow the, 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 the usual anxieties of deadline to really, you know, bother me. I mean, if it's not I mean, so, so sometimes not everything is going to go to the Pulitzer Committee. It's just not. And right. you have to realize that because your primary job is getting the column in. Your primary job is, is filling the space they reserve for you. Hopefully it's good. Hopefully it's readable. Hopefully people will talk about it. But your primary job is you got to get it in. Well, when Jim Murray would finish his column, he would always say, fooled him again. Fooled him again. And he was right. He fooled him. <laughs> he tended to fool him a little better than, than the rest a of us. A little better team. than I did. <laughs> Let's see if you hear well. Whether you are a brand new runner or you've been running for years, there is always a new way that running can change your life. And this is what the Planted Runner is all about. Being planted also means you're ready for growth. You can start exactly where you are right now and get better. I'm coach Claire Bartholik, and I've coached hundreds of runners of all ages and abilities with science-backed training, nutrition, and mental strength techniques. And on the Planted Runner podcast, I'll share it all with you. You can be a better runner at any age. I'll show you how. Mike, you mentioned the 2001 World Series. I think about that, you know, in the weeks after 9-11. What was that event like to cover as a journalist and, and what stays with you uh, even today? This story had probably as, as much of a personal impact on me as you probably could have had, not just because I like just about everybody else in New York area. You know, new people who were in the towers, um, I'd gone to school with them, and I did. I had several classmates from high school who, who died that day, so that obviously makes it personal. My father well, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't spend most of his adult uh, uh, career across the street from the World Trade Center. So when I would go to visit him um, at the office, I literally can remember, you know, watching the final touches being put on it when I was a little kid. So, and my father saw it go from the ground. So it, it was, it, it had that kind of a personal nature to it. But also just, you know, I, I think I learned a great lesson that time, which I drew upon years later during COVID is that you know, sports still matters, but you have to you have to be able to figure out what place it matters. You know, on September 12th and 13th, 2001, none of us could figure out how we could ever possibly get crazed about Yankees, Mets, or Army, Navy, or Ohio State, Michigan ever again, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it was like, how, how, how could that possibly matter? And then how, how I can go to, go to a movie matter? How can I listen to, to a Beatles record the same way ever again, or a Springsteen record? And yet, you know what, the same, way, the same way we deal with death in our personal lives, we deal with tragedy and you realize that, yes, sports matters, sports will go on. I'm a sports columnist, so therefore I must write about it. But it's also important to keep it, you know, in perspective and keep it in its place. And, you know, I think one of the great moments, you know, people ask all the time about the great moments in, 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 in New York post-9-11 sports and the Yankee World Series comes up. What's acknowledged as the first day night of, of sports being back was the Friday night, I think it was September 21st, when uh, the Mets playing the Braves, pretty important game. Mike Piazza hits a chilling home run in the eighth inning. And, I mean, people people cry for hours afterwards. It's just an emotional moment because there are cops and firefighters who were crowd that night. Liza Minnelli, if it's like New York, New York. I mean, it was, a, it was an unbelievable night. You couldn't possibly have scripted. And that's what people look at as when New York finally embrace sports again. And that was great. I actually pointed two days later when Armando Benitez came in the ninth inning and blew a three-run lead to the Braves and one of the Blues in the game and he got booed off the mound. <laughs> I mean, that, that to me said, all right, sports is going to come back. And now people are able to get mad about sports again and not just look at his release. And look, I mean, 
you know, 20 years later, when, 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 the, when the world shuts down for COVID, and it's funny, a guy I respect as much as anybody in the business, Kevin Manahan, one of my old editors at the Star Legend. I remember one time, about three months into COVID, he's like, dude, you, know, you got you, you, you to step back and, 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 and just work, work for new side now. I mean, there's so many stories. And I said, I appreciate that. You know, our mutual friend, Steve Bolitti, did that. He's, he, he moved to, uh, to, to news for a couple of months and did some extraordinary work. And there was extraordinary work to be done. But I also told him, and I, I mean, and I mean this, I mean, I, I found a responsibility, my responsibility and my job to be almost heightened to be able to give people reasons to read things other than death counts, hospital counts, and, and, and not to minimize the importance of those things because those things were incredibly important. The, but, but, but people need it, need a release every day. They just did. It didn't need, they, they just needed something, you know? Uh, and, and so that allowed me to do that. And COVID allowed, you know, an opportunity over the course of an extended period of time, three, four months when there was no games at all to write about. If you're going to write a sports, you got to write, figure something out to write about sports that isn't going to be grim or just, you know, or irrelevant. And so that was a great challenge in its own right. And I really, you know, it was it almost, not that I've ever lost my love for doing this, but it really it definitely, uh, you know, reignited, you know, the, 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 the reminder that you can, you, know, you can get by as long as, as long as you just remember the, 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 the basic tools that were taught in the beginning, you know, always know what the story is, go after the story, be a reporter, ask questions, be, be curious, be inquisitive, you know, you're going to still be able to, to make yourself relevant. I learned those lessons for the first time after 9-11, specifically that World Series, which was such an incredible World Series. And so it was, you know, it offered a daily reminder that, yes, this is great, and don't get too carried away. And uh, this, that was the same kind of, uh, you know, mindset I brought to writing during COVID. So what was it like in the press box when George Bush walks out to the pitching mound? Uh, it was electric. There was no such thing as Democrats or Republicans in the press box. It was just, it was just Americans. You know, uh, I, 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 I'm pretty, pretty sure I, I know that I clapped. I know that most of the people, you know, especially baseball writers, you know, that baseball writers tend to be a pretty serious lot. And there's, uh, you know, it's not just there's no cheering in the press box, but there's no cheering in the press box. But uh, how, you know, how could you help yourself in that particular moment uh, knowing what it represented? Um, and it was, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful. I think there was a strike. It made it even better. You've seen so many great moments, and I know that one ranks right up there with everything you've covered. Are there other sporting events or achievements that you witness as a journalist that stick with you in terms of what went on behind the scenes, the story behind the story that you came across while reporting and writing your column? Tyler, was the Sydney Olympics one uh, in 2000, and, and, and about halfway through, you know, you know that stretch where you just all of a sudden, you, just, you, just, you can't wait to get home, and you're still exhilarated because you're there every day. And my boss said, look, just, just go find something different. You know, it was like between the swimming and the track and field, so it was like those two couple of days where it's, you know, if you're not covering basketball, you, you know, there's, there's really nothing, there's stuff going on, but it's not the kind of stuff that's, that, that, that's lighting up the world. And so I, so I started, like, just, just you know, the way it was, it was set up in, in Sydney is there were pavilions within walking distance of the main press center. And so I, I just wandered into one. And as soon as I opened the door, it was just this deafening wave of, of just sound. And I walked in and it was a badminton match. And there were 6,000 people there. <clears throat> and as I soon discovered, it was Malaysia against Korea in a badminton match. Oh, that goes way back. <laughs> 2,000 Malaysians on one side and 3,000 Koreans on the other. Now, because it's the Olympics and because this is the kind of crazy stuff that happens at the Olympics, I had actually befriended a Malaysian reporter a couple of days earlier who was asking me questions about, about the dream team. And so I actually saw him and he waved me over and I wanted, you know, so, so it was, he, was, he spoke English and I asked for a background and you know, he told me about this. You just talk. There's a lot of history between both the countries and, you know, they're bad men. And uh, it was a huge, you know, in that part of the country, I mean, you couldn't even liken it to anything that we know, right? Um, and so I watched this match. Of course, it went the distance. And of course, uh, the favorite, South Korea, won because they always seem to beat them in the big matches. And it was just this most exhilarating thing. And I remember I couldn't wait to get to my, to my, to my laptop. And I wrote it. And it was, my, it was my favorite piece from the entire Olympics. Uh, maybe that or Rune and Garda, the, the Wyoming wrestling. That, 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 those are my top two. I filed it. My editor called me. He was like, 
What about badminton? I said, you told me to write about something different. What's more different than badminton? And he's like, all right, I'll read it first. Then, of course, he read it and he's like, oh, yeah, this is pretty good. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you want him over. <laughs> you know, I think about I had those moments. I had a similar experience with uh, table tennis, not ping pong, table tennis. That's, it was either absolutely. in Sydney or in Athens. And I wandered in, same type of thing. And lo and behold, here's this athlete, I think it was from Japan. And he was like, thought of as the Michael Jordan of table tennis. And he was so popular that he had to wear a mask when he was out in public because fans would just overwhelm him. And, that happens uh, to you in Columbus, right? Right, right. What's that? That happens to you every time, every day in Columbus. Right? Oh, no, no. They're throwing old fruit at me. So, <laughs> <laughs> But I just remember thinking that, yes, no matter where it is on the globe, whatever sport it is, Somebody really cares about this. I mean, you know, the thing is, that's the thing about the Olympics. I, I do miss covering the Olympics for those guys. I don't miss, I, I, I don't miss, you know, waking up at five in the morning to be one of 3,000 people surrounding Michael Phelps and Della. But invariably, at every Olympics, you, you do something, you write something. I'm at the Beijing Olympics. Um, you know, one day I was, I, was, I was walking with Joe Posnansky at, uh, we, we came to a, uh, to, to one of those table tennis parks that they have. We're just citizens, you know, I was like, we see, like, in New York, you like, see people playing chess. Right. I mean, and it was one of these places, there were, like, 40 table tennis. They, they were all occupied. And we happened upon one where there was this, you know, older grandmotherly lady who asked me if so I wanted to play. I'm like, sure. You know, I play table tennis. and play, 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 or in my day in college, won a lot of money playing ping pong. And, <laughs> so I said, sure, I'll play. I'll go a couple of, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go a couple of points. With her. And she crushed it. And, of course, I got a column out of it, right? It was awesome. Um, those are the kind of things that are, that, that are awesome. I, mean, I remember sneaking into the London, at the, the, you know, the, the day before the London game started, uh, me and police snuck into the, uh, into the stadium to, to hear Paul McCartney's sound check. Nice. Well, let me ask you, is there anything cool in the world in watching him mess around with Hey Jude? And we were making him, you know, I mean, they, 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 he was still messing, and, and, you know, in between, he would just like break out Blade of Madonna just, to, just to, to amuse the workers. I mean, it was the greatest thing ever. I mean, you know, I mean, then the, the, those same Olympics, I was walking with Woody and Dan Wetzel, and we look over, and literally standing right to our side is Prince Charles and Camilla. I mean, there's no bodyguards, it's just the two of them, a few friends, a few people. I'm like, this is just, well, where am I? This is weird. Did you ask him to write a sidebar? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, can you, uh, you know, give me 40 words and make it snappy. <laughs> Sometimes it's great moments. Sometimes it's moments behind the scenes. Sometimes it's individuals and people. Is there an athlete or coach or administrator that uh, you enjoyed covering? It used to be that way all the time. Obviously, it's less now because the access rules are such that we're, they know we're strangers even if we're in their clubhouse every day. Uh, baseball is generally where people understand that just the day-to-day is, as long as you keep showing up, they respect you and they may not like what you write, generally speaking. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the best, the best ones of the world are the ones who clearly get it. David Cohn was always the best and remains the best because he literally wanted to be a sports writer when he was a kid. It's instead, Did he really? Of, he was like you. He was like seven years old and wanted, was, to, we, 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 wanted that to write sports. When, he, when, when I told that story, which is like, that was me. I wanted to write the Kansas City Star. I'm like, well, I did write the Kansas City Star. I'm like, but you, 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 you pitched for the Yankees, the Mets. You win. But he's like, eh, that's some year. But, but that's, so, so that, you know, that, that, was, that, that was obviously unique. Um, you know, probably my favorite experience came with a, with, 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 a, with a hockey player named John Matt. He was a rookie in 2000 with the, with the, uh, with, with the Devils. Had a really nice career. Mm-hmm. But he was a rookie, and, and I, 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 you know, I, I, I watched play hockey as a kid. I never really covered it until the 2000 playoffs. I was at the Star Ledger, and the Devils wound up going to the Stanley Cup that year. And I wound up writing 59 hockey columns in 61 days, which is an achievement that I just... Wow. I can't believe that. <laughs> um, and when I almost want to put on my tombstone when it happens, because I mean, that's, that, that, that's just beyond belief that I was able to do that. But early on, I was already scuffling. I'm like, I don't know the sport. I don't know the players. What am I going to do? And John Madden came up to me. He didn't know me, but he saw that I was wandering around aimlessly in the clubhouse. And for some reason, he didn't realize I didn't have a clue, clue to write. He was 20, 22 year old kid. He said, you have no idea what you're going to write. I, I said, uh, I tried, but I, I don't. He's like, tell you what, over that guy, talk to him and ask him, ask him how his mother's doing. He'll get gold from him. I'm like, that's all I got to do is ask what his mother's doing? He said, yeah. 
And it's funny, so I'm like over there with Dredd thinking like he's going to tell me whether it's cancer, but no, it was, I mean, he had gotten, he, he, he'd gotten to an incident on a hockey, hockey arena. His mother endorsed him back then. There, there was a great story behind it without, without boring with the details. It was him on being a terrific column. The next day I saw him in the, in the dressing room and I told, I told John, I said, you know, thank you for that. He's like, no problem, mate. He said, uh, look, I mean, we're going to be here for, we got a good team. We're going to be in this for a while, so I'll see you again. He's like, don't make a habit of it, but every time you're in a rock, you can come and see me. Hmm. And so I did. That's interesting. Well, I, mean, I, I, I did not love a guy like that. He did. He helped me. And I remember, and I remember like, you know, I mean, I might, as a result, you know, he was a prominent member in the, of the column on the night they won the Stanley Cup. He hadn't scored a goal, but he'd helped me. So I, I, I knew I was going to, and he, he gave me a, you know, a side of the wisecrack comment, which was great also. But, but I mean, you know, he, he, he wasn't a part of the, he didn't score the game winning goal or anything, but he was, he, he was important enough to, to me to want to make sure I included him in the story that day. But uh, he, he definitely, he definitely got it. And in fact, he got it to the point where the next year it was getting close to playoff time. And of course, the way things are sometimes, like I hadn't, hadn't spent one day with the Devils until the playoffs. And so I, I uh, decided I was going to go to a Devils Rangers game just to say hello to my friends on the Devils. And so, of course, the game ends and they won. And they go over to Madden's locker and he stares at me. And he just, he spends 10 seconds just cursing me like I've never been cursed at before. Not even John Calipari. And he storms away. I'm like, Oh my God, what, what happened? I thought we were boys. He comes back to his locker and, you know, he says, wait, I said, you know, are we okay? He's like, yeah, I'm just messing with you. How you been? <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, which is probably, which is probably as, as, as one of the boys, a moment as I've ever had, you know, when you're in a clubhouse or a dressing room, when you realize you're absolutely not one of the boys, especially as you get older. Exactly. Well, as we wrap this up, um, there's one subject I want to throw out there. You can't be a New York Post columnist without being asked about Yankees Red Sox. You've written so much about it. You actually wrote a book, Emperors and Idiots, about the history of the rivalry. Yep. You know this rivalry inside and out, and you've mm -hmm. covered some iconic moments and saw great players. When you think about all the years of writing about Yankees Red Sox, what's the first thing that comes to mind, maybe a story behind the story? So... The Yankees, obviously, they have that 3 nothing lead in 2004. And the Red Sox come back, and they have the most incredible comeback in sports history. Of course, in, in New York, we consider it the greatest choke job in sports history. And so, you know, you know, by the ninth inning, you know, most of the Yankee fans had cleared out. And so, somehow, Yankee Stadium was, was throbbing with, Yankee, with, with Red Sox fans. Thank you, Red Sox. Thank you, Red Sox. And they, they wouldn't leave. You know, Todd Dixon came out and showered him with champagne. You know, here came Johnny Damon, did the same thing. They all did. And they wouldn't leave. And uh, somebody went to George Steinbrenner's office. And Steinbrenner was, you know, furious, of course. But he said, boss, we, 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 we're going to clue these people out. They won't leave. And George Steinbrenner, who probably hated the Red Sox more than anybody ever born, said, you know what? They've earned this moment. Let them stay. <laughs> really? Which I thought is one of the coolest uh, Bill James told me that story, which is great because I was able to, that, that was at that, I believe that was actually the final line of the book that you referenced. Um, and it, you know, I've, 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 it's, it's like one of the great quotes, even if it was given me secondhand. And I, later on, I, I confirmed it with George, who was always a, a guy I enjoyed talking with on the phone. Um, but, uh, but, but, but I think that that just shows you not just the mutual contempt they have for each other, but also the mutual respect. And what I always found funny, I mean, I assume it's probably like this with Ohio State, Michigan. I know it's like it was Army Navy just because I cover that rivalry a bunch. But, you know, when, when, when players first come into the Yankees, Red Sox, or those other rivalries I talked about, they're like, well, you know what? I don't, I don't understand because, I, I, you know, the Red Sox would always say, I got nothing to do with Johnny Pesty holding the ball. I mean, my father wasn't born yet. Well, how can I can? And it's only after they get into it, they realize, they see the fans and how much it means to fans and how much it means to then all of a sudden they realize, oh yeah, this is not something that's made up. This is real. You know, this is something that matters in a way that other games don't matter. It's they just don't. I mean, I, I don't know this. Less, I don't think it's necessarily true. Probably that a Ohio State coach could go one and twelve as long as the win is against Michigan. I do think that at Army, if you only won five games in five years and all five of those wins are against Navy, you might have a shot, which tells you about that probably. And of course, it wouldn't be the same way with the Yankees and the Red Sox either. But um, Look, I mean, the, the, the one thing the Yankees had over the Red Sox was um, that for, for almost a, a, a century, they believed 
that they were, the good things are going to happen to them, the bad things are going to happen to the Red Sox. Yogi Berra would, always, would, would come to every game seven or every, every, every important game between the Red Sox and the Yankees and just walk around the room and tell Bernie Williams and Derek Witter, Jeter, these guys don't beat us. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. And he was always right until 2004. And, uh, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't share this one story with you, which is, which, which, which is different. So, I'm, so I'd written that book, uh, and it was almost done in its entirety. And it was pretty much, you know, a history of the Red Sox-Yankees rivalry, but told through segments of the 2003 season, which kind of underlined everything that I was talking about, right? Because it was, it was a, they, they wound up winning on Aaron Boone hitting a home run, of course. Mm-hmm. Right. And Red Sox blowing a big lead in game seven. And so uh, that, that, that's what the book was supposed to be founded on. All it needed was about a 4,000-word epilogue based on, like, what happened in 2005. Boom, we're in. And of course, the Yankees go up three nothing on the Red Sox. So this is just perfect. I've already spent the money on my condo at the Hamptons, and I'm going to write with all the blood of the world in this book. And the publishing house couldn't wait; it was going to get. Of course, they go up three nothing. Go up in the you know, they're up in ninth inning, game four. I am just perfect. And of course, they blow game four. And my friend George King, who covered the Yankees for many years, and cantankerous, wonderful man. And he turns to me after when he saw that I was a little bit glassy-eyed when, when, when the Yankees lost. And he said, um, nah, don't worry about it. You know, that's one game. Don't, don't worry about it. You're good. Game five comes. Yankees are up in the eighth inning. Red Sox come back again, winning extra innings. George turns to me at the end. And he's like, go on to the stadium. It's, it's all good. Don't worry about it. You're fine. Game six happens. Crazy game. The Yankee Red slap game. All that nonsense happens. Okay, we, we call a home run, bring it back. George stirs me and says, might have a little bit of trouble. <laughs> Game seven happens, and Kevin Brown is throwing his fourth warm-up pitch. And George stirs me and says, you're effed. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. And so <laughs> I had to rewrite about half of that book. So you know, that, 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 that comes out to about 50,000 words in three weeks. So you talk about someone who's not bothered by deadline. If I were bothered by deadline, I would have been able to do that. And you know what? I can tell you, I can sit here 20 years later and tell you that McKamey was a better book as a result. But, you know, it didn't, it did, I didn't get my, Hamptons, my house in the Hamptons. There were about a million Red Sox books that came out to uh, flood the market. So it was, uh, it was an interesting experience, but a great experience. When I'll, and, and just those four nights with George made it all worthwhile. Well, it's been a great experience knowing you over the years back. Um, we go back, I mean, I was covering Xavier basketball and, uh, Cincinnati Post, which no longer exists. That's how old I am. And you were covering St. Bonaventure, the Bonnies. And we were just young guys scrapping along, trying to figure out how to do this. And, right. um, you know, you went on to such great success over the years and and writing for the paper that you grew up loving for 21 years now to New York Post. I'm so happy for you. I am so, so happy that your health has improved and um, I'm so glad that you're still in the business, writing great columns. Four-time New York Sports Writer of the Year. That's, that's amazing and well-deserved. And I just want to say thanks for, uh, for your time and sharing your stories about uh, your career. The hour went too quickly, Todd. It was great spending time with you. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Press Box Access. You can find us here with a new episode every other Wednesday. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe and follow us on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. We'd love for you to review us. Five stars would be nice. Follow us on social media. Drop us an email at pressboxaccess at gmail.com. And be sure to spread the word. Everyone is welcome here. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to executive producers Michael D'Aloya and Gerardo Orlando, producer Bill Hoffman, and our audio engineer, Nathan Corson. I'm your host, Todd Jones. It's closing time. Rock on. Hit Pass Moto, sponsored by Moto America, is the show that keeps you up to speed on the latest in motorcycling and brings the biggest names in motorcycle racing right to you. From candid interviews with the top names in racing to providing insights into the trends and trendsetters driving the motorcycle industry, we have you covered. New episodes are available every Thursday at pitpassmoto.com and on your favorite podcast app. Ride on.